But I'm not an artist and I'm not trained in the art area, so I might be speaking to some of the pieces, but that will be more about my reactions, my impressions, um, and I'll be speaking more from the area of psychology and the experience that I've had in working with combat trauma. Okay. Um, my first question to myself when preparing this talk was, why am I invited? Um, I couldn't quite piece it together until someone quite obviously said there's a lot of links between my work and trauma and war. Um, I was thinking about, well, why is this interesting to people? Why do we have a fascination with war and with trauma? And why do we want to come and see that depicted here? Um, I think it's because there's a lot of myths around what trauma is. Uh, one of the big myths is that trauma is rare, um, that it's a very unusual event, that people don't experience trauma very often and so there's a fascination. It's that car accident phenomena, you know, you could be driving around not noticing anything but if you see a car accident everyone wants to see what's going on um, and everyone has more accidents watching it. Um, so in light of that, I was thinking, why, what was my interest in seeing this exhibition? When I knew it was coming up, I was interested. I did want to come here and see it. Um, and even though apparently I'm an expert in the field now, I, I felt that coming here would give me an insight in what, what's combat like? What's it like to be on a war-like deploy, deployment or to experience war? Um, and when I was looking at the images, I felt frustrated because I thought, I still don't really get that. I get a glimpse, I get a little slither of what that might be like, but not quite. I don't feel like I know these people, I don't feel like I know what's going on. Um, I was speaking to a combat veteran this morning and, and explaining what I had to do today, and their comment was, um, why would people think they're going to know what it's like? I've never had the experience of being child, swear deleted, scared, and adult alive within an art gallery or a lecture hall. Who else thinks that they're going to get that experience there? Um, which is true. We don't. And um, the more that I look at these images that, that were not produced in Afghanistan, that were produced, um, you know, back home, often under artificial arrangements. Um, Brad was telling me earlier the the bigger works out in the foyer that, that was Ben asking people to look at the sun and then open their eyes and getting a snapshot of that which will give you a tortured expression um, but it's not a reflection of whether you were a tortured soul at that time. Um, so from a psychological sense from the point of view of working with resilience I think that these images give us that moment in time that people may... These ones, I think, are a bit more authentic, um, although they may not have been produced in a combat-like situation. But it gives you that mo what that person felt in that moment, um, which is not necessarily what that person felt in the next moment, in the next year, in the next five years. Um, along with our, oh, I didn't debunk the myth from earlier that trauma is rare. Um, trauma is not rare. Most of us will experience at least one traumatic event in our lifetime. Um, and so I think that leads into the next myth that if you experience trauma, you will be traumatized. Um, which for me would mean in the psychological sense, getting a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. So what we see is that probably 80% of people will experience at least one trauma in their lifetime. Why aren't 80% of us traumatised? We're just not. Um, people are resilient. And so in defence, in combat veterans, we expect to see higher levels of PTSD symptoms. Oh, does anyone need me to go over what PTSD is? Okay, I, I tend to plough forward and then some people don't get that. We'll come back to it later if you want. Um, higher levels of symptoms, you know, when they first return back from deployment, they might have elevated symptoms. That's actually the normal response. Um, it's not my normal response to be living in a camp where a rocket comes in and blows it up and for me to then be fine. Um, it's not my response to want to go there, which I think is what makes veterans different to civilians that they want to. 
um, or they wanted to enlist and at some point knew, knew it would lead there. So we see these moments, we think that we're going to witness trauma, understand what it's like to be traumatised, when actually we might see some very vulnerable and some tender moments of these individuals. Um, but it doesn't follow that they all became traumatised or were damaged by the experience. Um, many people grow from the experience, um, which is part of the area that I'm interested in, in positive psychology, that we can experience trauma and actually bounce back to be stronger and better functioning individuals than we were at the start. Um, are there any questions so far while I consult my notes again? No? We're cool? Alright, cool, yeah. Um, the, the obvious point, and which I might have expected someone to, to ask here, um, okay, if trauma is common, is combat trauma the same? So, obviously it's not. We have difference. If I'm walking down the street and I'm assaulted one time, that's a trauma. It's a discrete trauma. Um, if I'm coming home from Northbridge at night and I'm raped one time, that's still a trauma. It's very different to combat trauma. It's different to being sent for months at a time in a place where it's very obvious and apparent to me that my life is at risk at all times um, and where there will be multiple events where I will be at risk or injured um, or under threat in some way. Th this is what separates our groups, or what I would call the high risk populations from the civilian populations. So we look at defence, law enforcement, um, fire and emergency service workers. These are people that have intentionally gone into a career where they know they'll be exposed to these high risk, potentially traumatic situations on a regular basis. Um, again, even with the multiple exposures, the, the maximum rate of traumatisation or PTSD we'd expect to see in these populations probably around 20%. So we are inherently resilient people. Everyone has this hardiness inside of them um, which protects us. Um, my research is about can we build that further? Um, which in speaking, given so many of us are already resilient. Why? Um, but with all the training and the investment that we put into individuals like this, if 20 to 25 percent of them might have symptoms of PTSD at some time, we'd like to see that lower, I think. We want better than three quarters of our people to be functioning well. Um, so that's my research area. That's what I work on. Um, this led me on then to think, this is a very roundabout, this is what I was thinking about. Um, I was wondering, sending these artists out there to, to share with us about part of what is this experience like for our, for our combat troops, for what is the experience like for the artists that went. I watched some interviews with Ben Quilty about what it was like for him to just turn up in a war zone unprepared, not trained to do it. Uh, part of the protective factors for our troops is that they're very highly trained to be able to do this sort of work. Um, what would be the impact of that? Would that be protective for any of the soldiers that he worked with? Would it be damaging? Would it be protective or damaging for him? Um, in line with the literature, because I'm an evidence-based researcher, an evidence-based psychologist, I was thinking about what evidence do we have there? Um, one of the biggest obstacles we have to reducing PTSD in populations like this is that it's not spoken of. Um, again, I was speaking to a combat veteran oh, a couple of weeks ago um, who told me they'd been on multiple deployments, had served for years um, and did not know what PTSD was which was a shock to me. Um, I'm biased, I talk about PTSD every day, um, but I thought that in this day and age, someone who was enlisted and it's mandatory protocol that they're briefed about what PTSD is, would know what it is. 
Um, th this is our biggest barrier to preventing and treating PTSD in these populations, is that it's not spoken about, it's poorly understood, people don't understand <coughs> what it's all about. I think a lot of troops that I speak to um, have a bias that I'm not going to get it, other people get it, or none of us get it. Um, in special operations type units. None of us get it. We were selected in. We're better than everyone else. We're tougher than everyone else. Um, they still get it. It's not spoken about. And the population, um, or the civilian population, I think has the opposite view. Oh, you've been to war, you're traumatised. But yeah, we can't, let's just, you okay? Um, they're okay. They're probably okay. <laughs> um, this middle ground where we actually talk about it is where we start opening up the avenues to treatment um, and, and prevention. And so I thought that was one of the biggest protective factors that we can see we have people interested in what it's like to go away, what it's like to be in combat. Um, and we have these images funded, produced, exhibited to open this area for conversation around what this is like and what it means. The, um, when, when I was working with combat veterans, I was seeing people, I saw a World War II veteran with it for their very first presentation to therapy. Um, when you haven't understood what a mental health problem is or how you treat or prevent that for the majority of your life, it becomes very difficult to treat. It's very treatment resistant, you don't know what to do. Um, oh, I, I know what to do. <laughs> The client doesn't know what to do. Um, <laughs> I thought I'd clarify that. <laughs> On the other hand, I saw young veterans, people who'd been in Afghanistan, Iraq, just returned, um, with sky-high symptoms. Symptoms to, to the point where I would read the file and think, oh, I don't know. I don't know what to do here. Um, because they knew it was a problem, they knew what PTSD was, they knew what the service was to get assistance and how to do that. They could turn up and within four or five sessions be symptom free. Um, usually in trauma that would be the last time you see that person but these people are probably going to be deployed again and so they might be back. Uh, but that's one of our big differences in preventing and treating these kinds of mental health issues is that we, we have the forum for conversation, uh, we have an opportunity to provide preventative measures to provide treatment to the people who are at risk um, and also that there's a culture that they can talk about it and they can access those measures. Um, that, that is one of the biggest ways that I think this kind of exhibition assists troops that have been out there recently um, and people who might be in high trauma, high risk situations in the future. Um, I think that's pretty much all I've got on my notes. Yes. Yes. Hey, what are the symptoms of trauma? So people come in and you say, oh, it's trauma cancer. How do you know? What, what, what is the symptom? Yeah, so, yep. Okay, so I use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual to diagnose disorders. So at the moment, we have four clusters of symptoms for PTSD. Um, oh, the first criteria, of course, is that you have to have been exposed to a trauma. Um, and there's a list for how that's defined. It's generally an um, inherent threat to your life um, or, or your physical well-being. So severe assault could, or, or rape, something like that, that might not have killed you um, would constitute that. Um, we're looking for four clusters of symptoms outside of that. So the first cluster is intrusions. Um, that is generally intrusive thoughts. Uh, memories of, of a trauma that come in and won't leave, um, flashbacks, a sense that you're reliving the event and can't escape that. Um, so that can be um, memory, images, sights, smells, sounds, anything um, can be triggered for the intrusions. Uh, another common one with the intrusions is nightmares. Um, the other end of, oh no, that probably comes in a different cluster, so I'll tell you about that later. Um, the second cluster is avoidance. So that can be um, avoidance of reminders of the event, um, which often spread. Uh, a common one that is quite easily understood is 
in fire and emergency service workers. They've been to a number of um, fatalities or motor vehicle accidents at a particular intersection. It becomes quite common for them to avoid using that intersection ever, um, which can be problematic over time and especially if that branches out that you know if it's not just that intersection but then I need to stay a block away from it and then I, um, the avoidance is quite high. Uh, when people get further along with their symptoms um, the avoidance can end up be avoiding work. Um, fire and emergency and police that's common just calling in sick just stop going to work. Um, avoidance is easily masked because particularly in PTSD people will use um, substances, especially alcohol, um, to, to avoid the thoughts and feelings that are coming up. Um, the third cluster is changes in thoughts and mood. So this can be either completely absent memory of the event or denial of the event. Um, also changes in core beliefs, so like, I might get around day to day and think oh, I'm a pretty competent person, I'm pretty safe in this world. Um, the two common changes in belief that we see in people with PTSD is I'm not a competent person, so this happened to me because there's something wrong with me, I'm not coping because like, if I was a stronger person I'd be coping well, I need to hide this because people know I'm not doing very well. Um, but also a belief that the world is now inherently unsafe and needs to be avoided or protected against. Um, and hypervigilance or arousal is the last cluster. So um, heightened startle response, very, very exaggerated reactions to noise or movements. Um, often, this, this is a tricky one with combat veterans because I think they're trained to have some of these symptoms. So the, they will be trained to walk into a place and to scan around and know where the exits are and to not have your back to crowds and, and things like that, um, which a psychologist would typically be like, ooh, ooh, hypervigilance. Um, <laughs> so um, you would need to look for more than that in a combat population. Uh, but yeah. That was quite a lengthy answer. Did, was that? <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, I'm a daughter of a Vietnam vet. Okay. Who's got very, very high level post-traumatic stress. Um, and we do have problems with my mother, particularly, that's very cross when we talk about war uh, or that my father might look at war films or things because he does certainly get affected and then shows more symptoms. Mm. And I'm just Yeah. Um, that's. I, I'm obviously not a digger, so but I can answer based on experiences of people I've spoken to about this. Um, that there are some people who are very enthusiastic. I know some people who wanted to be in defence since a young age, got special permission to enlist before they're 18. Um, that's their career, that's their lifestyle, and they want to go to everything that is related to that, and they're enthusiastic about it. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, I know some people who have separated from defence and want nothing to do with it. Um, they wouldn't consider coming to something like this. They want to move out to a farm in the middle of nowhere and never talk to anyone ever again. <laughs> and um, that's maybe avoidance symptoms, um, but may just be the nature that they've had enough, enough people. Um, the, the experiences range everywhere in between. So some people would see this and have an appreciation that um, I, I was thinking about uh, in one of the interviews with Ben that I was watching he was saying he was trying to create their, their emotion what they were feeling at that time and he said many of them when they saw the image that was created they were like oh you've nailed it yes that's it and I think if someone else um, from a deployment situation, not having done it myself, if they came in and saw that and it resonated, that that, that could be quite a warming experience for them. Um, but again, I also have, um, there was a Vietnam veteran who I treated who was triggered by going to a Vietnam exhibition at a museum. It was very lifelike, there was a hologram, there was sounds, um, and that triggered the first episode. So it, it's a very personal, 
Um, I would. I think each veteran knows themselves best. So if someone said they didn't want to go and see that, they're not interested in that, they're not. Um, but yeah, it's certainly something that if I was here with a return service member, one of the diggers, something like that, I'd just be mindful to keep an eye on how are they reacting without the... <laughs> um, <laughs> but just, you know, checking in, are they going okay? Um, if something is triggered, do they have a way to manage it? Yeah. Yeah. I can give some more info around that question, of sort of around our experience of being at the open here at Star. And lots of us had lots of conversations with people about their own experience, people coming up to us and wanting to speak about it. And I think this ex exhibition in particular kind of shows a vulnerability in a safe environment, and I think people can really connect with that and the experiences that they're seeing in the kind of expressions within the paintings themselves. So yeah, it, did, it felt like a place where it opened the door for people to, to be vulnerable and, and be able to start talking about these things. Sometimes you can't talk about things and it's a visual, but it's at all. To, to be understood is... Um, yes. Yeah. The, um, the, the biggest message that I get from people, especially people with PTSD, is no one would understand. It just isn't possible. Yeah. Yes? I was thinking about people are attracted to high-risk sort of jobs. Yeah. Do you think it's a cultural thing or is it a personality factor or do you have any sort of view on what makes a soldier in it? I think it's a mix. There are some personality traits that are required for that in any high-risk profession. Um, I, I probably reference firefighters more at the moment because they're the population I'm working with at the moment. Um, but you know, there's something in you. fire. Run away! Like that's what we learn. For it's hot, don't touch it. If it's fire, you run away. And so there's something in these people that says fire. No, nah, run towards that thing. And how can I help? Um, which is, I, I've also, I've always had a strong aversion to war and combat and so for me this idea that there are people that have a, some overriding value system or overriding desire to, to help or for their own reasons, whatever it is, that they're saying yes, yes to that, Let, let's get in there, um, baffles me a little bit. But yeah, I think there is a certain makeup of people that are attracted to that. Um, it's also, you know, we screen people when they want to go into these kinds of professions. Um, we can't screen out everyone that might have a problem, but I think there is a, a definite makeup of what happens. Yeah. So family background will be a part of it, but it's mainly personality factors, I would suspect. What's your family background in terms of military people in the family? Or yeah, yeah. I've, um, which could go either way as well. Some people who come from military families, they don't want a bar of it. Um, but I think if you've at least been raised to have that level of reverence and respect for the job that these people are doing, um, if there's, oh, there's a lot of other arguments now about whether we glorify war, that people of my generation have not been through a major conflict or not really been exposed to that um, in the way that previous generations have. That, that can be a part of it if that's the culture in your family. Um, I'd say there are some families where war is just a, no, war damaged our family, we would never do that, we, you know, um, and those people are highly unlikely, I'd say, to enlist. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Uh, what, what was your first uh, experience of working with PTSD? Was it traumatic for yourself? Because uh, I, when I was talking to like ex-soldiers, and I, uh, I think it was quite traumatic for me actually to hear about that, like about yeah. the experience, and that it was like really scary. Uh, I think I was completely not ready for hearing about that yeah. such a thing. How was your reaction? Um, I guess the stories, some of the stories can be shocking if you're not prepared for them. So um, usually in the therapy room, I'm prepared to hear what I'm going to hear. Um, vicarious or secondary trauma is a real phenomena, so therapists 
can experience PTSD as a result of things they've heard. Uh, I haven't had that in, in the context of combat trauma, um, but there's certainly things that I've heard that I would never repeat to another soul. Yeah. So, and, um, and I would say in general conversation, we don't even get a sense of what are the worst things that have happened. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Affect what happens after? yeah, that does make a difference. Uh, and the camaraderie and mateship that we see with the diggers, I, I think is a protective factor. Um, the studies of, that have been done in this area around different groups, so, so specifically different units that have gone to different places, they've looked at what the leadership was like in that group, what the sense of social support and camaraderie was like in that group, and it has a direct impact on how well you'll cope with stress and trauma. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and particularly, well, I'm thinking of instances of combat or war-like trauma that I've heard where the person was there alone. Um, or with one other who may not have returned, they're, they're experienced quite differently to traumas experienced in a group. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a couple of more minutes. If there's any final questions? Yeah, well, I'm just adding on to what Leah was talking about um, in terms of the yoga, you're hearing the ex service people's stories. You're also hearing the family stories, such as the children that may be over in Afghanistan now. And I guess that, those people's own trauma. Right, so, so do you mean if, if, um, if you're hearing of these experiences and you think someone needs support, how do you help? I've been really quite open about things as well, so I've probably got the opportunity to say that there is actually support for, for what you're feeling. Yeah. So to realise that, that um, I guess the people that are the support networks have so much trauma going on as well, and how is that, how is that different? And are they getting those support networks too? Yeah. Um, I do worry about like if one unit has had a trauma and then they're supporting each other and they're doing that at the pub, how well that's going to go. Um, if it's, well, one time, yeah, that's probably more effective than seeing a psych and I'm happy to be on record saying that. But if it's every day, like how supportive, yeah, if your supports are also struggling, what are they going to do? Yeah. Yeah, VVCS is um, under Department of Veteran Affairs, and so that oh, I can give you the information. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So they, well, all around the country, and veterans, past veterans, and their families, and um, so partners or children um, can self-refer there, um, and that's fully government funded. So uh, that's usually my first call of recommendation because it's fully confidential, even if you're currently enlisted, it's not required for VVCS to report back to your MO um, or, or anyone else in the hierarchy that you've attended. Um, and also, they're, they're specifically trained in treating only combat trauma. Yeah, or, and I guess the spin-off um, stresses that might arise for living with someone who's been affected by combat trauma. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I guess we, we get very fixated on this and we want to know how do we support these people, what's this all about. Um, but we also have uh, probably one of the most popular images I can think of at the moment. Did anyone see those US Marines that covered Call Me Maybe? <laughs> They're out in the gun. Has anyone seen that video? Oh, do yourself a favour and look it up. These people are also having fun. Um, I think that's a really good example to me of, first of all, a hilarious YouTube video. Um, but secondly, they have a lot of time. Um, they have really strong mateship between um, each other within the unit. 
and uh, sometimes really good things are produced out of that and, and there's positives and it shows them enjoying the environment, um, using the, um, <laughs> everything that they have at their disposal to their advantage um, and, and having fun with it. Yeah. Um, it's quite yes. interesting listening to you talk because I attended one on Saturday with the Air Commodore and John. Yeah. And yep. So that points itself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he and he talks about like, you know, the impact of the war what's had on them. And it, the sol the soldiers out there in that open gallery, he said it he said they were deliberately painted on those white big open spaces because it it was about documenting the younger soldiers who mm -hmm. went to Afghanistan. And then here these dark images talk about the impact the psychological impact of people who have been in war for a longer time. And yeah. see, for these people that posed for these pictures, it was almost like a healing process for them, and sort of actually realising what they were going through. And even though uh, the portraits of him, the middle one is the first, he was very confronting for him, and it took a long time for him to actually look at it, but he realised you know, what were the impacts of post-traumas? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Close enough, yeah. So it's a different, it's a different way yeah. of documenting. It, it's a nice way to process, isn't it? I've heard John speak about it, um, and I imagine it would be very confronting, um, but that also to get that, um, to have your experience mirrored yep. and really matched by someone else is a very powerful way to heal. So, yeah, I would suspect that some of this was a healing process for the people involved. Yeah. yeah. If, if they had PTSD program. to start with. Sorry? It's almost like an education program as well for someone who hasn't been in war or knows little about. It's an education as in, like, well, what does go on for people when you look at the yeah. images? Yeah, to, to start to have an understanding. Kind of yeah. Fully yeah. It's sort of, you know. Yeah. It is that fascination, the fascination with the car crash. Um, and yeah, my, my only concern, it, well, that we don't want to minimise that. We don't want to minimise the severity of PTSD and what combat is like. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have no representation of people who have coped really well with war. That's why Right. Yeah, we don't have time to go into every portrait at the moment. Um, it's just about time to wrap it up. Is any other final comments, questions? No? Excellent. Well, thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you.